Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. It is six o'clock on the dot. Um, I'm just going to give people another minute or two to, you know, kind of trickle into the room and then we'll get started. I think that's great. I'm looking Good. forward to it. As are we. So how's the weather in New York? Um, painfully hot. Mm. It's about 90 degrees today and there's a heat advisory today, I think through the through Friday. Oh. So mm. it's it's pretty toasty. Wow. But you'd have to work outside D. No. How's the weather where you are? Hot. Yeah, hot in all that you just described, but I work outside. Advisory today, I think through the through Friday. Hold on one second. Now I'm hearing myself on Facebook. So it's it's pretty toasty. Wow, but you'd have to work outside, D. No. How's the weather where you are? Hot. Yeah, hot in all that you just described. Hold on one second. Now I'm hearing feedback. Let me mute myself for one second, and then we'll get started. Okay, hopefully my little feedback is gone. Yeah, I was hearing it also. Yeah, okay. Technical difficulties and we're back. Okay, so it is 6.02. I think we will jump right in and get started. Um, so hello everyone, thanks so much for joining us. Um, just first wanted to let you know that this program is being recorded and will be available on our Facebook, YouTube and our website after today. Um, so feel free to share, you know, after the fact. Um, so welcome back to the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum's virtual lecture series, talking about race matters, join the conversation. My name is Meredith Horsford and I'm the executive director here at the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum. We are delighted to continue this lecture series. As many of you know, and may have attended, we started this series in August of 2020 which was so successful that we brought it back in February of 2021. And of course, now again. So thank you so much for those of you who have returned and of course, welcome to any newcomers. This is a five week series that is centered around reestablishing sites, introducing an inclusive narrative to cultural and educational institutions. Each week we will host a different speaker from various fields, including historic sites, art, archaeology, and preservation, followed by a Q&A session. One of the most important topics throughout history, and certainly in recent years, is the topic of race. Race influences our lives historically and certainly in the present, which is the reason that we began this lecture series last summer. We at the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum feel that it is important to have and to facilitate conversations about race, even though sometimes they can be challenging. Our goal for this series has been to encourage everyone to come together, learn from one another, and to continue the conversation. Before we get started, I'd like to get you familiarized with Zoom to get the most out of our lecture tonight and make sure to get your questions and comments answered. Please use the chat box feature to say hello to other attendees and to ask Melissa, our Director of Development and Community Engagement, any technical assistance questions that you may have. During the lecture, if you have any questions for our speaker, please click the Q&A button at the bottom and we will answer these questions either during the talk or more than likely at the end. We at the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum thank everyone so much for joining us this evening. We feel strongly that our programming remains free of charge so that it is accessible to all. The response to this series has been overwhelming and there is clearly a need for us to talk more about the issues that divide us and the issues that unite us as Americans. As a small nonprofit organization, we rely heavily on grants and donations to support these programs. This event is made possible by funding from the New York Community Trust. We are grateful for their contribution that has assisted us in the continued success of this lecture series. This fall 2021 series is also sponsored 
by the Bowery Residence Committee or BRC for short. We have worked closely with BRC and community members over the last year to bring awareness to the Inwood African burial ground that sits between 211th and 212th streets on 10th Avenue in our, in our neighborhood of Inwood the potential new location for a BRC shelter for people experiencing homelessness. To learn more about BRC's important work and community efforts, head to the link in the chat. If you would like to make a donation to help us continue our community-focused programming, it is greatly appreciated. In lieu of a donation, we also are selling t-shirts that highlight the names of the enslaved and free people that lived and worked at the farmhouse with their names on the front and say their names on the back. You can scan the QR code on the screen with your smartphone. Melissa has also shared the links in the chat. A purchase helps support our cause and further research and educational programming on the topic of the enslaved and free people highlighted on the shirt. So tonight we are joined by Mr. Joseph McGill, History and Culture Coordinator at Magnolia Plantation and Gardens in Charleston, South Carolina, and founder of the Slave Dwelling Project. 11 years ago, Mr. McGill spent a night in a slave cabin at Magnolia Plantation and Gardens, where he is currently employed. Now, 25 states later, and the District of Columbia, he has spent nights in over 150 slave dwellings. He is joined in these sleepovers by many people from across the nation. Tonight, Mr. McGill will delve deep into the campfire conversations that are conducted before the sleepovers occur. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Joseph McGill presenting bedtime stories about slavery and the legacy it left on this nation. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm looking forward to the presentation. Uh, yes, uh, bedtime stories about slavery and the legacy it left on this nation. This uh, is about what we do at the Slave Dwelling Project and uh, how we have evolved into a simple sleepover uh, starting 11 years ago until uh, uh, to this thing that we do around campfires and that's have conversations about slavery and the legacy that is left on this nation. So, um, you know, talking about race matters is, is very important. When I was uh, asked to do this, um, I, I saw it, it was easy because it's what we do, we, we talk about race. Um, so it came from a, a simple idea, uh, you see on the screen there are two slave cabins. These are located at Magnolia Plantation and Gardens in Charleston, South Carolina. It's at uh, Magnolia Plantation. And Magnolia Plantation, I'm I am currently employed there uh, on a full-time basis. So if you come Monday through Friday, you can uh, come on uh, from Slavery to Freedom tour. Ask for me because I alternate with folks when I work there. Uh, and you can come on my tour uh, at, this, at this site. But 11 years ago, it was because these cabins were being uh, restored or uh, even prior to that in, in 2008 when these cabins were being restored uh, I was on a team of experts that evaluated the work at the cabins as they were being uh, restored. And I said out loud that when the work is finished, I would like to spend the night here, sleep here. And because I said it out loud and the right person heard it said out loud, they started asking uh, people, the decision makers to make it happen because they thought it was a great idea. Um, but of course, uh, you know, my intent was to was to have that experience because at that time I was a Civil War reenactor, and we go we would go to Civil War battlefields, and we would spend the night at these places. So I I knew how that worked. I was also um, a, an employee for the National Trust for Historic Preservation when these buildings were being restored. Um, and of course, the National Trust for Historic Preservation is an organization that restores building. They're known for that, um, but they're usually the, the uh, they're usually the iconic buildings, House on the Hill, um, the architecturally significant buildings, which does not include the buildings, the slave dwellings that are usually associated with them. 
Well, knowing that these buildings exist, existed and still exist, um, I came up with the crazy idea of applying the sleepover to these buildings. And um, they thought it was a great idea. I got a list from the State Historic Preservation Office of such places. Uh, and when I got that list from them, I started making phone calls from that list I got from the State Historic Preservation Office explaining my intent. Uh, there were those who got it immediately. They said, yes, come on, let's do this. So um, I made a list of places in South Carolina. Of course, it was just my intent to stay in South Carolina. And uh, because that's where my limited resources would take me. Um, so I started making the phone calls. I, 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 I got them listed as I wanted them to. I started staying in these places. And, and of course now, 10 years later, I'm sorry, 11 years later and 25 states later and 150 sites later, I'm still at this thing. Um, so the idea of, of sleeping in these places is, is quite simple, sleep. You know, anybody can do that. That's, that's, that's easy. Uh, as you see me lounging there, um, actually sleeping there, uh, or laying um, there uh, on the left, in that photograph there uh, on the left, uh, the Hempstead Houses in New London, uh, Connecticut is where um, that, uh, that particular scene happened. Um, so as you can see, uh, you know, we're still at this thing in places where some people would suspect that um, slavery never existed. But it, you know, it did, it did exist in Connecticut. Uh, my definition of where slavery existed 11 years ago has now expanded. Um, it, it expanded because <clears throat> a, a lot, uh, there are some who are under the impression that uh, slavery was a Southern thing and a Southern thing only. Um, well, we've got, uh, we got the evidence to justify that slavery was indeed a Southern thing because it did take a civil war to end slavery uh, in the South. But uh, it also existed in those Northern states and it, uh, it, it ended there legislatively, um, you know, after the Revolutionary War. But, it, it's because of the need to recognize these places and bring attention to these places is why the Slave Dwelling Project exists. Because uh, you, uh, I know it's hard to read, but that, that Virginia textbook there, uh, a textbook, meaning that people were learning from this book, um, it talks about the happy slave and the benevolent slave owner. And, 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 and this was the education that I received being a South Carolinian, born and raised in South Carolina, educated in South Carolina. It was this history, this revisionist history that I was taught um, about the happy slaves, benevolent slave owner, um, uh, moonlight uh, and, and magnolia. And knowing that there are other people out there like that, or knowing then that there are other people out there with the same education level or, 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 or worse than that, um, all these things came together. The necessity to uh, bring attention to these places, these buildings that still exist, so that we can bring attention to the people who existed in these spaces to let folks know that it's more than the Virginia textbook was teaching. It was far more than that. These people had agency, these people were human um, and they need to be included in the narrative as such. Um, so we know that if the places are there, you know, we're capable of, of ensuring that uh, the people who inhabited those spaces where um, uh, their stories is inserted into the narrative because this place will be there. It's kind of a placeholder, if you will. It's, it's, it's kind of like that place you need to, uh, to see to know that it existed. Uh, so right on the screen right now, um, I talk a lot about the narrative. Uh, if you look at that image on the left, you can, if you look hard enough, you can see that I'm in there, but you can also plainly see hoop skirts, um, and that's the narrative, guys. That's the narrative that um, uh, has been um, disseminated, disseminated uh, to a lot of to, to a lot of folks. Um, Holly Springs, Mississippi, where I took that photograph uh, years ago, 
when the Slave Dwelling Project was young, um, these uh, homeowners who had bought a, a home in Holly Springs, Mississippi, and with this home came a slave dwelling. Well, um, their thought process was, well, we need to talk, we need to tell the story about this slave dwelling. We, we, we can't just let it just sit there and, and not be interpreted. Well, the Slave Dwelling Project was, uh, I think, in the second year when I was contacted by Holly Springs, Mississippi and those homeowners because they wanted to uh, tell the rest of the story. And, and I went there with that intent. And the first year that I went to Holly Springs, Mississippi was great. It was beautiful. We, uh, we were working with the garden club, garden club guys. Garden clubs are, are usually older white women um, who are most active. Um, but they were into this thing. They were into telling the story of the big house, which was fine. And also telling the stories, be, um, uh, extend the story beyond the back door of the big house. And this, in the program we do there now is called Back of the Big House. And I will be going there next month um, to, to continue that. Um, so uh, they found it necessary to change the narrative. They found it necessary to do more than just let these folks see, see these nice, beautiful, big homes, but in, uh, talk about the stories of the people who made it all possible, who built that nice, beautiful home, whose labor was stolen for that nice, beautiful home to exist, insert that into the narrative. Um, so Fort Monroe, guys, I got to hang out at Fort Monroe just recently. Um, and I'm standing by that sign that verifies the first Africans in Virginia, um, 1619. The, there's a lot of discussion around 1619, not 1619 versus 1776. It's patriotic education, it's uh, critical race theories, all that stuff is, is, is thrown in now to um, the conversations that we have. You know, uh, we talk about race all the time around these uh, around these campfires so i travel to these places to uh you know to, to feel these places by sleeping in these places inviting others to to join me at these places now unfortunately most recently i couldn't uh, i couldn't invite anyone to join me at uh, at fort monroe fort, Mr. fort Mr. monroe because we were in the midst of COVID, the first round of COVID. So I did stay there uh, alone on that, uh, in that uh, Fort of Monroe. Of course, I say alone, but anybody familiar with Fort Monroe, you know that there are people in that fort all the time. People actually live inside, in, inside the fort. So, so there is that. But uh, I did have the pleasure to, to go there and uh, connect with folks through the means that I'm talking to you right now. Um, and of course, race was part of, um, of, of what we talked about. We talked about those enslaved people who took a chance going into Fort Miss Run Fortress Monroe uh, at the time of the Civil War, very early on in the Civil War, and the commander of the time not knowing really what to do. Um, and he decided to hold them there. And that's the term, that's where the term contraband came from, spoils of war. Uh, and not sending these enslaved people back to their masters because sending them back to their masters meant that the masters will then lease them out or, or, or to the Confederate army. And now these people will be used against the union. So the union at that point start just uh, kept them there as contraband and kind of set the standards throughout where the Union forces would go um, uh, in the future. And um, formerly enslaved people would come into, uh, into, into their line so they would know from that point what to do with them. Hold on to them, keep them, let them uh, work for the Union Army and get paid. So in this narrative that we need to change, uh, which is kind of difficult for some because what we see there on the screen now is, is, is Mount Vernon. And Mount Vernon is of course the home of George Washington. George Washington is one of 12 slave owning presidents. Um, yeah, so, so when I talk about what I do and, 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 and talk about slave owning presidents, 
I get a lot of pushback, guys. There's a lot of pushback because we have elevated these men to a place where if we tell the whole stories, the whole story about them, um, people get upset. Um, so in this evolution of, of the slave dwelling project and, and talking about race, you know, we have to, we have to talk about the facts. We got to talk about the fact that, you know, 12 of our former presidents were slave owners, eight of whom owned slaves while they were in office, you know, 25 signers of the constitution were slave owners, 41 signers of the declaration of independence were slave owners. Uh, and we, we, we have to, we have to deal with that. And we, we, we get to deal with that. And it took me a while to get into uh, Mount Vernon, but I got there. I got there. It took like five years from the time the first person said that they could get me there until I actually got in. But uh, when I got in there, we had a, a, a beautiful time, a great conversation about uh, George Washington and the other presidents uh, that, um, you know, that would come after him. Uh, so it was all good. Now, if you look there to the right of the screen, that is the, that's the Hermitage guys. Uh, that, um, that's the home of, of Tom, um, Andrew Jackson, the home of Andrew Jackson. That was my first presidential site that I, uh, where I, I, I spent the night. And they, they do a great job there with the, with the narrative. Uh, they are more inclusive now uh, with the narrative. Uh, and, um, you know, a lot of folks think about Andrew Jackson and they also think about, well, at least I do. I think about the, the Trail of Tears, Indian removal, um, which was not highlighted when I was being educated, when I was in a position to learn more about our, our, our presidents. Again, we elevate these guys to a place uh, where they're, they're, they're godlike. And when we found out otherwise, when we found out that these men had flaws, it, 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 um, it, it tends to have an effect on you, at least it, it did me, I guess a negative effect uh, in the sense that, you know, this history that I was taught was, was watered down, was, was sugar-coated, was, was a history uh, that, uh, that appeased the, the victors. Uh, in, in the stories of those who were enslaved or those who were purged were, were minimized or, or, or switched, if you will, or flipped, if you will, uh, as in the enslaved people were happy or the enslavers were benevolent. That uh, I think, uh, you know, I label that as, as junk history. And that's the, that's the history I came to this uh, project with. Um, but it was also, it's all a part of a learning process because I had to purge my mind of all that. And I had to replace it with now the things I know, uh, now the things that I disseminate uh, uh, to the public. So it, I guess it's come around um, to a place where that history was useful. So now uh, uh, in the narrative and in changing the narrative, I, I go to some very interesting places, guys. Um, Robert E. Lee, the, the birthplace of, of Robert E. Lee, Stratford is, is that photograph there on, on the left. Um, I, I spent the night on the, uh, in the laundry room there um, at, at Stratford. Very, very interesting. And I got a, a trail that I'm following um, for, for Robert E. Lee because I stayed in the home of his father when I was in Alexandria, um, Virginia. So I'm kind of following that trail of, of Robert E. Lee. So you guys can kind of think about the conversations that we have at sites like this. Um, and you, you cannot avoid talking about race. I don't care if it's this site or, or, or any other site uh, uh, where we go to because the opportunity to talk about race exists in the fact that these audiences that we, that we muster at these places are, are, are diverse. Diverse in the sense that, um, you know, Black um, uh, um, black, white, uh, uh, Hispanic, Asians. I mean, we, we, we have it all uh, at, at these sites around these places that have these conversations. And uh, we talk about slavery and the legacy that is left on this nation. We talk about Confederate monuments. We talk about 
uh, historical trauma, white supremacy, white privilege, all that's on the table. And, and now that uh, we have gone and experienced the, the death of George Floyd, that's on the table now um, in, in these discussions that, that we do. And having, imagine having conversations like that at places like this. So the, uh, the house on the right, John Jay, Chief Justice John Jay, New Yorkers, you should be quite familiar with uh, Chief Justice John Jay. John Jay was instrumental in ending slavery legislatively uh, in the state of New York in 1799. Uh, but we all know that the last person freed in New York was 1827. In 1703, 40% of New Yorkers were slave owners. But John Jay, back to John Jay. John Jay, um, as he advocated for the freeing of the enslaved people in the state of New York, he was enslaving uh, at least one person at that time, if, if not more. Uh, and it's interesting that we see these things in history, kind of like, uh, it, it's, it's kind of like, our president Thomas Jefferson and um, and Sally Hemings and my sleep over there and and talk about race and talk about um, uh, other things. Um, the conversation there was about Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings, consensual, non-consensual. Well, the the conversation got so heated that I had to physically step in between two gentlemen were that who are about to come to blows. Um, so these conversations are, are that strong guys. We, 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 we talk about things. And of course, being at a, a, a site like this, uh, black folks and white folks and being in a setting where you don't usually have these conversations with people who don't look like you, uh, you know, beyond this opportunity that's being presented to you now, you know, Race is, is it you know permeates you know permeates throughout and you know as I said earlier sleeping is easy anybody can do that um, but the conversations that we have before the sleepover is now the substance of of what the slave dwelling is is all about so we look forward to these opportunities to uh, gather at these sites and and, and do these things uh, and and of course the sleepover is the nucleus we pivot on that. But now the conversation before the sleepovers is, is, is vital also. So, all right, so bedtime stories. Bell Grove Plantation, Middletown, Virginia. Okay, that's it there on the left and on the right also. Bell Grove Plantation, Middletown, Virginia. So I've been going there for consecutive years. It's because, it's because of several reasons main reasons is that they invite me back. But the fact that these conversations that we have at, at these places and this place in particular is usually so, so rich. So I don't know if you, if any of you, I don't know how many of you know Dylan Roof. Well, Dylan Roof was the gentleman who made, who went into the church here locally in Charleston and took out nine lives this young white man go into this church and, and take out nine lives while they were in Bible study. Now, talking about race matters, race matters right here. So this happened in, in that church. And one of, the, uh, uh, one of the persons who was shot was a personal friend of mine. So, so there's that. So now we're sitting around this circle and this young lady uh, states that her brother is mimicking Dylan Roof. You know, the things that Dylan Roof was doing before he committed that act, you know, checking out these websites, owning weapons and, uh, you know, saying things that are Dylan Roof-ish, if you kind of know what that is, so Confederate flags and all that stuff. I mean, he was immersing himself in, in all that. So I said that to say this, in these, conversations that we have, these things come up, these things pop up, and they certainly are about race. It's certainly more th than just gathering at these places and sleeping um, at these places. 
you know, I, last night, not, well, two nights ago, excuse me, I was at the home of James K. Polk, um, spending the night there with some, some folks who were, um, you know, um, were, were, they were receptive to the message. Um, and as, as far as I know, um, they, they took it in well. Um, but it was, it was a difficult conversation for, you know, for, for two white men and, and two black men uh, at a site, having a conversation about race at a presidential site. So we, we got to do that. We got to do that two, two nights ago. Again, that, that speaks to the power of, of what we do and, and how we do it. Um, so we look for all the opportunities that we that we can. We get invited to places. Sometimes we get invited back. Oftentimes we get invited back. Uh, a lot of times we we go to some of these places for for the first time. So um, looking at what we see here on the screen, uh, Stenton in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The reason I wanted to talk about this one is because this one was probably the most diverse audience that that I've ever experienced at a site. Um, we've got, we had uh, Jewish, uh, people of the Jewish faith. Uh, we had a, a young lady from France, um, a, a, a gentleman from, from Ireland. And the gentleman from Ireland, he kind of scared me because he told me some things that, um, you know, if I, if, if, if I was on a witness stand, he, I don't, I, I think he told me too much, but anyway, I'll put a period right there. Um, but, the, but the conversation that night inside the space, uh, we, stayed, we stayed inside the space because they don't have any slave dwellings in, uh, there anymore. And then when that's the case, that's okay too. We'll, we'll come to these places and, and we'll pitch a tent at some of these sites uh, if we have to, because we, we try to re reward reward uh, effort. Um, because you know if, if somebody is interested in telling the stories of the enslaved, we wanna give them, a, give them that opportunity to do that. And we want to acknowledge them um, um, for, uh, for that, all that they do. So this is another example of slavery existing you know, in a, a Northern state. You know, again, that that attempt to put slavery in a box, keep slavery a southern thing, it, it doesn't work, guys, because we've got primary sources. Primary sources always lets us know that um, you know our our ancestors existed. They were a part of of this na uh, of this nation, the building of this nation, and as much as as uh, um, they attempted to write us out of history. You can't do it because the primary sources are there. Uh, you know, even with the effort now to uh, make what we do forbidden, make these conversations we have forbidden, um, forbidden in the sense that you know they try to not uh, teach it in classes or, or threaten people not to teach it in classes in some of these states that some of you may be from. Um, that's uh, one of the 35 participants. I, I'm, I would wager that um, one of you are probably uh, in a state that, that maybe does not want to talk about these things or have these opportunities at these sites to talk about these things. And speaking of that, I, um, I got from a, a reliable source that there are funders out there uh, inquiring at museums, uh, inquiring about museums and their mission and their what they teach or what they display in these uh, museum, and they're trying to align it with this um, uh, this cr critical race theory uh, thing. So, if you guys haven't heard that yet, be on the lookout. It's out there. Um, so, yeah. So. The, so bedtime stories. So here's one to the left. Interesting. That's that's New Orleans, Louisiana, guys. New Orleans, Louisiana. The Beauregard Kai's house. Now, the Beauregard Kai's house is interesting for two reasons. Well, of course, Beauregard was, you know, Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard. He ordered the first shot of the Civil War fired on the Fort Sumter. You know, the federal forces that were in Fort Sumter are, uh, you know, they were being shot up. Uh, shot because 
Pierre Gustave to Tom Beauregard orders the first shot. Okay, so now after the Civil War, he, he lives in this house after, in New Orleans. Well, that was interesting because of course I'm a Civil War reenactor, of course for the Union, but, 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 but the gentleman who the house was, who built the house initially was not Kais, K-E-Y-S, no, it's not him. It was someone else who built the house initially. Well, the gentleman who built the house was an auctioneer. And guess what he was auctioning? Yes, um, people. So that made it even more interesting that I could go to that space and, and, and interact and have one of these conversations. But it got real interesting because there was a, there was a white gentleman there who uh, talked about we would, well, the conversation, the general conversation was about free labor, that the fact, the fact that, you know, the enslaved people were, uh, were not, they weren't getting paid, you know, they were slave, they were enslaved. Um, he said, well, no, it wasn't free labor. He was, it wasn't free labor because the enslaver was, was providing them a home, providing them food, providing them clothing. Okay. Not that he was wrong. I mean, he was right, but his timing was off. And, you know, the, the rest, everybody else really wanted to physically, physically harm him. And I had to kind of step in between all that. Um, so, you know, again, those are the things that we talk about around these campfires. Okay, Magnolia Plantation, Charleston, South Carolina. So we're sitting around the campfire and uh, we're kind of in a, we're kind of in a wrap up mode. And then we, it gets around to this young lady and, and she makes this confession. And she confesses that her father was a member of the KKK. And she left home because her father slapped her for looking at a black man. Talk about race matters. That moment, a very jaw dropping moment uh, that we had to you know, pick out a uh, uh, get our composure back so that we can, can could continue the conversation. Of course, by this time, the young lady's in tears, so she had to be consoled and all, and, and all that. So, so these are the kinds of conversations that we have around these campfire. These are kind of the, the matters of race that, you know, that we, that we deal with. This is the opportunity that we have. This is the, uh, what these sites can do for us. Uh, and, and we try to, to utilize that ability to the best of, of, of our knowledge. So yeah, those are, you know, those, that's the things that we uh, have the power to do at these sites. So, you know, Middleton Plantation and Magnolia Plantation that you see there on the screen, you see these images of, of people, you see these images of, 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 of demonstrators and the people doing the work, the people focused on are, are black. They look like me. Okay, so once upon a time, you could go to a site like this, right? You could see this kind of stuff being demonstrated, but be, be demonstrated by white folks. Now, historically at these plantations, it's highly unlikely that a, a, a white person would be doing those things. White person would be, the, it's highly unlikely that a white person was a blacksmith, or highly unlikely that, the white folks were making the bricks that, that are now those buildings. So that's why we created this, uh, this element of us, this uh, element of the slave dwelling project known as inalienable rights, living history through the eyes of the enslaved. We're kind of a uh, Colonial Williamsburg on wheels because we know that most of these sites don't have anybody on staff that look like us. So we give them these opportunities to you know, give us an invitation. And so we'll come and, you know, we'll, we'll hang out with you guys, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come and we'll tell the rest of the story. We'll, you know, we'll tell that story that, you know, you, you, sometimes you can't tell. Sometimes you're afraid to tell. Sometimes you, you just don't know how to do it. So, you know, we'll, we'll come there and we'll help engage your audience and, in this element of the history, we'll have those conversations with, uh, you know, with your audience, and we'll, you know, we'll engage them and and let them know that uh, all that this that they have been accustomed to coming to this sites, this sites are these sites to see. There's more to the story. 
um, than just what they've been seeing for the last um, however many times they may have visited at that site. And a lot of times we go to these places, a lot of, a lot of people come for the first time to that site because we're there, which is a good thing. And a lot of times that makes that moment the most diverse time in recent memory at that particular site. And that's a good thing too. Um, so, because as I look at these audiences, being a, an employee of the of, um, uh, Magnolia Plantation in Charleston, South Carolina, and seeing the audience, uh, seeing that the audience now is <clears throat> getting more diverse, and, and that's a that's a great thing too. I wanna I wanna commend uh, folks out there that come to these sites, um, especially folks who look like me, because there's a lot of historical trauma involved um, at these sites. You know, visiting plantations is not on our short list of things to do, but um, I'm hoping that that changes because you know there's that effort out there like what we do with the slave dwelling project and there are other organizations out there i know a lot of good uh, uh folks out there a lot of good organizations out there uh doing uh, what's necessary to have a narrative that's that's all inclusive so as you see there on the screen we we have our uh, uh we have our living historians uh doing uh, what they do now middleton plantation uh jamal he is the resident um he that's his full-time job guys demonstrating blacksmithing now that's a that's that's a nice gig um a blacksmith and the gentleman there rodney prelo um he's at magnolia plantation where i work he's demonstrating uh brick making rodney will be traveling with me in october to to louisville kentucky so we're looking forward to that Ah uh, yes, the narrative guys. So I get, I, I get to, to to experience some some very interesting stuff, because in this thing you you don't know what's around the corner, uh, um, you know, waiting for you. So searching around, I know it's very hard to see, very hard to read, but I just wanted to put it up there anyway. That's a that's the grave of a of a white overseer, um, and to 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 go and. And, and touch a grave like that. Um, I know there are folks out there probably want to do something else to the grave, but 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 uh, erase those thoughts. Um, but you know, to to be able to to experience that, guys, that was that was a, a moment for me. Um, so those are the kinds of things I, I I experienced in this journey. So if you if you look at the one on the on the right. So I work at Magnolia Plantation and Gardens and buried there is uh, Adam Bennett. He was a black slave driver. And in, in, in other words, overseers were usually white men. Well, a black slave driver is uh, has the same duties as an overseer, but some separate the term. Because he was black, some some call him, uh, they, they use the term slave driver. And that's what uh, that's what Adam Bennett was. So now the, the, the enslavers are getting the work out of the enslaved people at no cost of paying uh, a white overseer. Hmm. That's something to think about. Um, so, you know, these are, these are the moments that I, uh, that I have, I come across. And again, this is, that's a matter of race. So, okay, then there are family reunions. I already touched on the fact that it's sometimes difficult for black folks to visit plantations. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we can change that guys. I'm hoping we can change that for several reasons is because that's where our ancestors inhabited. Uh, our ancestors inhabited these spaces. And I think that anywhere it, it, that can be identified with their presence and, and their presence acknowledged, I think is a good thing. Uh, well, I wanted to pull this one out, Somerset Plantation, because, you know, here's a family that, um, that, that want, wants to interact with the site where their ancestors were enslaved. And one of those um, couples in their the married couple in, their, in that mix somewhere, um, they got married on, on that plantation. And I pulled that out because 
I know um, getting married on plantations is controversial, but these uh, folks, black folks who got married on this particular plantation, they got married on, the, well, the gentleman got married on this plantation because he had ancestral ties to this, to this plantation. And um, I know a few black couples who got married on, on plantation. And, and normally, usually it's because they have ancestral ties to these places. So when you think about white folks getting married on these plantations, um, put that all in the mix. Put that all in the mix when you, when, when you think about it. Um, so we, you know, we, we certainly uh, want more of this. We want more of this. I think for every wedding on a plantation, there should be a, a, a black family reunion or at least an attempt to have black family reunions. And another thing about black family reunions is this, you know, just because one family of, of, of black folks trace their uh, presence or uh, existence to a, a plantation, doesn't mean you have all of them because not all of these black folks on these enslaved people on these plantations were related to each other. Some were, many were, but not all. So just because you think you've got one black family that can trace their presence or their ancestries back to a plantation, don't think that you have them all. A good example of that is, is Thomas Jefferson. Of course, we know um, Sally Hemings uh, and the descendants of Sally Hemings. Well, there was also a family of, uh, their last name was Gillette. So, you know, they were another branch, another element of, of enslaved people living at these sites. So, you know, kind of, kind of think about that when you are communicating with these um, descendants of enslaved people. Kennedy Farm, guys, right there. Um, that was a very interesting occasion. Kennedy Farm uh, in the background, that's where John Brown planned the raid of Harper's Ferry, right there. So that group that I'm with is a group that I've been meeting somewhere in the United States for the last at least five, six, maybe longer years. So this teacher, uh, Mr. Chris Lease is his name, L-E-S-E, L-E-S-E. -E. Uh, I met him years ago at, uh, at Gettysburg, excuse me. Yeah, I met him years ago at Gettysburg College. We were at a conference and the, and the Slave Dwelling Project was new at that time. He told me about this program that he had um, as a history teacher. He teaches history, of course, during the regular year and during the summer. They go on a two week trip to kind of visit the places that he taught about during that particular year or that semester, however that works. Uh, Marquette University High School is the name of the school. It's a, it's a Catholic school, Jesuit Catholic school. He said, you know, meeting you somewhere and, you know, hanging out with you maybe uh, maybe two nights or so of this two week journey would be nice. So we made it happen. And for the last uh, five, six, seven years, we've been meeting somewhere. With, well, right here, we're at uh, Kennedy Farm. And that's where John Brown uh, planned the raid of um, it planned the raid of, of Harper's Ferry. Well, there was one time I was I was hanging out with this group and uh, we were at Bacon's Castle. Bacon's Castle, talk about race. Oh, Bacon's Castle, it, it, it's got race all over it. You know, the, um, uh, you, you've got the indigenous servants and, and the enslaved people, you know, kind of mixing, kind of kind of getting together and, 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 and working against the, the upper class folks. But Kennedy Farm, well, um, Bacon's Castle, another time with this particular group, we went on a, a tour of Nat Turner's uh, raid, Nat Turner's massacre, Nat Turner's revolt. And uh, in the conversation that night, the question was, if you were a person of that time referring to me, uh, would I have joined Nat Turner? Well, before I went on that tour, the answer was no, because I thought I'd be more like a Frederick Douglass. But then I went on that tour, and then I said, yeah, I would have been marching right with it. <laughs> and, and one of the 
teachers got really upset. I mean, he said, but he was killing children. I said, well, you know, um, if, if a doctor operates on you and, and, and because he, you have cancer, you want him to go in and get all that cancer if he operates on you. Well, children inherit, this was chattel slavery. Chattel slavery means that not only are you enslaved, but your children and your children's children will be enslaved. So that means that children will inherit, uh, in, inherit your children and so on and so forth. Um, and I said, yeah, he was, he was, he was doing that. Um, but that's what those revolts are, are, are all about. And he, it, it just really upset him. So it got to be, you know, about more than just, just race. It got to be about, you know, the, the fact that children were being killed and all that. So, um, so we had that conversation there, um, at, at Bacon's Castle. So the one there at, at Locust Grove is, that's Louisville, Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so we have grown from there. We now have form, formed a group. We formed a group um, and we're working with local historians uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. And we're going to gather there uh, in October. The first time we had a conversation with this newly formed group. We talked about descendants of enslaved people at all those sites in Louisville, Kentucky, in this coalition. They were kind of lukewarm to interpreting the stories of those people who were enslaved there. Well, now they're doing a better job. As a group, they're doing a better job. And with the Slave Dwelling Project, we're helping them do that you know we're being that face uh, out there we're, we're we're kind of sponsoring them if you will we're letting them know that uh, interpreting the lives of the enslaved is a good thing at these sites that's the thing now uh, and they should you know they should get on board and continue to build on what they do so that we're certainly talking about race uh in Louisville, Kentucky, and of course, we it's necessary because of Breonna Taylor, and in uh, and, and that in, injustice. So when we go there uh, in October, we're going to make sure the story of Breonna Taylor is 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 lifted because that's another thing about what we do. We connect dots. You know, we 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 express the fact, or, or we highlight the fact that a lot of these po police forces that exist today. Uh, they had their existence out there founding in um, some of these police forces or some of these people who were patrollers, you know, between plantations, ensuring that there weren't uh, freedom seekers or runaways, as is known by some. Um, you know, if you were off the plantation, if you didn't have a pass, you're a freedom seeker, you're a runaway, and, and you're treated as such. So some of these police forces were, were, were started to, to perform those duties. Um, so, so we again, we connect those dots. Uh, uh, another thing that we talk a, a lot about now is, you know, disenfranchisement and, and, and all those, you know, the wealth gap and, and the fact that um, slavery, uh, so a lot of people try to equate or relate reparations to slavery. Well, if you continue to connect the dots, we got to talk about all those things that replace slavery, you know, like the KKK and lynchings and convict labor and poll taxes and Jim Crow laws and uh, black codes and massacres. And yeah, those things, you know, those things that, that continue to disenfranchise. So we get to connect these dots around these, around these campfires and all those components that I, that, that I talked about, you know, redlining and all that stuff. That's race, guys. It's, it's, always, it's, it's always about race and, and, and it always goes back there. So we get the opportunity to do these things at these sites. So I, you know, I think this is the last slide here. So um, that's the old Charleston jail. Old Charleston jail, they say that's the most haunted place in the city of Charleston. Well, I've slept there five times, five times. And the last time I slept there, guys, is because we did this program about the recidivism rate of African-Americans in the prison system. Now, those bricks that you see there were made by enslaved people. 
And um, I don't know if you anybody saw the movie Glory. If you saw the movie Glory, um, that's the truth that actually happened. You know, Denzel Washington. Now, uh, Denzel Washington tear that's that got him the Grammy. That probably never happened. It may happen. I don't know. But those bricks are made by enslaved people. After that battle, men of the 54th Massachusetts were held prisoner there. So um, that justified me spending night, spending a night in that particular jail. Well, spending five nights in that jail. But the last program that we had was about the recidivism rate. So, we, so, so we're using these buildings, guys. We're using these buildings to, to, to help educate. We, we, we want you to, you know, to be able to interact with these buildings you know, in a way that um, it's going to spark something in you, hopefully something good, something that will make you do good things. Um, but we, we want to make sure that um, you know, wherever we can use these buildings to talk about race, and all those things, slavery and the legacy that is left on this nation, you know, we, we do that. Um, so at some point, I want to talk about the conference, but I think I'm going to yield right now to our host to see how she wants to proceed. Well, we would love to hear about your conference. Um, can I ask you a few questions first? And then I'd love to hear a little bit about your conference. Okay, the first question that we have here is, what does it feel like to sleep in a slave dwelling? Oh, it feels great. Um, you know, especially when I'm there alone. Um, it, it's, you know, you, you, you feel right, right now, um, it feels serene for me. Now, now, 11 years ago, by myself, it was a little nervous, a little eerie. Uh, that very first night in Magnolia Plantation, there was a tree limb kind of interacting with the roof as the wind blew, and I had to get up about five times to verify that's you know that's what that was that I was was hearing. But I eventually drifted off to sleep. Um, so you know, but you think about those things, you know, while you're trying to get to sleep, you think about enslaved people and the fact that you know you got mothers giving birth to children who, by law, was not theirs anymore. Um, you know, chattel. You think you think about you think about men or women, all enslaved people, working and not being able to benefit from that labor. You know, it's all for 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 their enslavers. You think about you know you think about running away. You think about you you you, you think about you know bloodhounds, your chances. You think about the way you are. Like at Magnolia Plantation, you know, you know there are alligators there. You know there are snakes in the in those swamps. You know that where one plantation ended, another one began. Um so you know your chances of 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 making it as a runaway is you know is, is little to none. Um so you know you, you you think about those things and then eventually you drift to sleep drift off to sleep. Thank you. Okay, the next question is a little bit longer. It says, why is it that we as Blacks hold on to slavery and we use it in every situation to explain what is going on, crime, incorrect behavior, et cetera, today when every nation moves on from their enslavement and misfortunes to prosper? Yeah, um, well, uh, some nations move on by paying reparations, like England moved on by paying reparations, but to the enslaver. Um, you know, uh, so there's, there, there's usually, you know, some type of um, compensation or, or truth and reconciliation. We haven't had that yet. We, we, we're still in denial of, 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 of all that, that we've done as a nation, all the wrongs that we've done. You know, we're a great nation, but we, we obtain this greatness by um, some, doing some foul things. We did some atrocious things, some atrocities, um, and 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 we don't want to acknowledge that. Um, you know, uh, I, I think you know, if we if if we had moved on in a manner that we should have moved on, I think uh, you know, Native Native Americans wouldn't, you know, would be a lot more prosperous than than they are. You know, we did a we did a thing, we did a job on. On, on the indigenous people of, of this nation. You know, we did a job on uh, enslaving people and 
uh, in, 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 in freeing them and in, in continuing to disenfranchise them. Um, you know, a lot of people think, I may have st stated this already, that um, reparations should be tied to slavery, but we got to think about those things that continue to disenfranchise. And, and, and we, we're still, we're just in denial of all those things. And, 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 and there's, and there's that, that, that effort in this, in, this, in this thing to move on, there's that effort to take us to a place where um, what we do or what the Slave Dwelling Project does is forbidden. You know, they don't want these things taught to children. Um, and how can we move on when we continue to lie to ourselves uh, or, or sugarcoat the history or try to make our, tie our history up in a bow? It was never that. Why are we trying to make it that now? Um, so I, I think in, in this moving on, we got we, we to gotta acknowledge the fact that, um, you know, we just committed some atrocities and we need to atone for all those atrocities. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next question is, do you know or have you spoken with Michael Twitty? I know Michael Twitty well. Michael Twitty and I will be hanging out next month in Mississippi, Holly Springs, Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. My buddy, I got his signed copy of his book. I haven't gotten his, that's what I need to do. I need to get his most recent book so I can get it, get it signed when I see him. So yeah, I know him well. Great. Um, next question is, are you planning to be at a site in New York? Yeah, you know, I was at a site in New York. My last, um, out of, no, not yesterday I was at a site, but that was my last out of time. But prior to that, I was in, um, where was I? Sleepy Hollow. I see that Phillipsburg Manor in, in, um, in the Hudson Valley. And two weeks prior to that, I was at Van Cortland um, in, in the Hudson Valley. But next year, I'll be coming to Van Cortland in the city, New York City. Um, so the answer is yes. Short answer is yes. Fabulous. Okay. And then someone else asks, what would you say to someone who says that slavery and other sad stories are unpatriotic? <laughs> I would say... Um, you know, we either, you know, if if they are, then we're lying, we're lying to ourselves that um, then we want to stay in a, a comfortable place. Um, and staying in that comfortable place, uh, it just lets us continue to to um, accept the history that that keeps us in that comfortable place. Um, you know, yeah, it's sad. <clears throat> um, you know, no, that's 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 the problem. You you. We, we, try to, we try to sweeten it up. We, we try to make history more appealing and, and we make it a fairy tale um, because you're not telling the stories of, of all, of, of all the people involved. You're not telling the stories of, of those things that are gonna make us uncomfortable. And those things that, that, that make us uncomfortable is, is, are, are those things that we haven't been talking about all the time, you know, purging natives and enslaving Africans and uh, you know we we mentioned the word reparations. People go scurrying in the in, in the other direction, but reparations isn't always money. Reparations is 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 what we're doing. You know, reparations. Uh, you know, I don't know the the demographics of of this audience of the uh, thirty seven people that are that that are viewing this right now. Reparations um, for me, you know, is the opportunity to to be a part, be a presenter. You know, for me, it's standing in front of these tourists that I stand in front of all all day, and and telling them, you know, the real story. You know, that stuff that they that they came there with is 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 not all real. It's it's incomplete. So I like to help them. You know, um, you know, complete that story. And I'm and I'm not, I'm not there to. Um, you know, make the enslavers benevolent. And I'm not there to make the enslaved people happy because none of that was real. Um, so, you know, you gotta, you, you gotta be uncomfortable if you wanna learn this thing. Okay, and I have a question from someone who you know, who says, why don't you plan to come and do a sleepover at the Dykeman Farmhouse? Yeah, we can make it happen. We can make it so. That's it. hey, you know when I when I do this thing um, for Van Cortland, maybe we can make it one trip. Uh, but we're yeah, literally right down the road from Van Cortland. Yeah, we'll see. That 
well, okay. maybe we can make it one trip. Make it, we can make it so. Uh, I'm in. Good. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so now I would love to hear about your conference. Yeah, the conference is uh, it's, it's called uh, Changing Narratives and Changing Times. We, uh, we were supposed to do this last year physically, you know, <clears throat> at Clemson University and here in South Carolina. But of course, you know, last year is, is, is not a blur, but we try to forget it. Um, so this year we're gonna, we're gonna do, it's gonna be digital. We made, we made that decision. So uh, if our technician can drop the, the link in there, that would be great. I should have had that ready, but I, I don't. Um, um, you can register for the conference now. And uh, we've, got, we've got some great speakers. Uh, Dr. Hassan Jeffries is our, he's gonna lead off. Uh, 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 we've got uh, Carolyn Newman, uh, who's an Arthur, who lives in Germany. Uh, we've got Dr. Uh, Baptiste, who is a uh, uh, professor at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, there are three keynoters. We've got uh, a personal friend of mine, Dr. Uh, um, uh, Angela Hartig. Uh, she is uh, uh, the director of one of the Smithsonian museums. Uh, Dr. Carol West uh, uh, of East Tennessee State University. So we got a lot of high-powered people. And you know, if if you're if you're in a place where you want to tell the story of enslaved people but don't know how to, or, 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 you know, you might be in a stage where you just need to enhance what you already do. This, um, you know, this conference can, can help you do that. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, you can go onto the site and see what we got and, um, it and register. Uh, oh, beautiful. Yes. yes. Good old, good old, good old technology. Great. That's right. It's amazing. Thank well, you, Stephanie. She's on the case as is Melissa. Um, well, thank you everyone so much for joining us. And thank you so much, Joseph. This was a really fantastic discussion. Um, I hope all of our attendees enjoy, enjoyed it and uh, you can watch it back after the fact as well. Um, we also hope that you'll consider making a donation to enable us to continue to offer free programming. Um, gifts in any amount are appreciated. I also would like to remind you that this was the first of five lectures in our Talking About Race Matters Join the Conversation series. Join us here every Wednesday at seven, at, I'm sorry, at 6 p.m. here on Zoom. Be sure to register through the links in the chat and follow us on social media for updates. We will see you here next week, next Wednesday, September 1st at 6 p.m. for I Was Here, Reshaping the American Commemorative Landscape by the I Was Here team. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. You're welcome.